Welcome to Nick Rocks, where you see and hear who you want to rock to. Today, that dynamic duo, they might be giants. Guest host. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. Roll that beautiful bean footage. You really can't oversell the importance and impact MTV had on the cable television market. Not just because it made a lot of money early on, but I would argue that it was the first true cable channel. What I mean is, if you were in the pre-cable times, it would still be easy to wrap your head around the idea of an all-movie channel, or an all-sports channel, or even an all-children's show channel. It just takes things television already does, but more. But while music videos in the technical sense had existed in small quantities before cable, people didn't really know what to do with what were sort of advertising pieces for pop music and sort of artistic works in their own right. It wasn't until cable allowed the existence of specialty channels that niche products like this could find a home for itself. It turns out that cable television and music videos were a match made in heaven, a perfect intersection between creativity and commercialism. And, of course, everyone else took notice and wanted a piece of the action. Some tried to make direct competitors, like Ted Turner's Cable Music Channel, which was sold on the idea that MTV aired videos that were degrading towards women, but in reality was more likely developed as a way to challenge MTV's exclusivity deals with labels. In any case, the Cable Music Channel only lasted five weeks. A full-scale 24-hour music video channel costs a lot of money up front. A more reasonable idea was dedicated music video shows that could reach an even more niche audience. BET's Video Soul series actually predated MTV by a month and gave a presence to black artists that MTV failed to deliver on. We're out of time, but before we go, I'd like to invite you and your family to join me for tomorrow's show when we'll have a new cut from a new group called Strap. Now, they bring back the zaniness of Funkadelic, and we think that you're going to enjoy their song coming from another place. Taking us out of here today is one of Prince's big influences, James Brown, and Living in America. We'll see you tomorrow. Many of these music video shows had an element to attract young viewers. On the Nashville Network, or TNN, you had Country Clips, a country music video show hosted by a puppet character named Shotgun Red. Pretty Miss Dana McVicker, how you doing, Dana? I'm doing good. How you doing, Shotgun? What? Oh, yeah. my heart's going bumpity bumpity bump. Boy, I'm so glad that you came by today and you brought oh. us your new video too, right? I'm so glad to be here. Yes, I did. I brought it just for you. And instead of airing the music videos produced by record companies, the Disney Channel opted to make their own music videos for a show called DTV, taking popular music and editing it to footage of Disney shorts. To the beat of the rhythm of the night. Music video shows were the hip thing to do, so naturally Nickelodeon was going to take another stab at them. Their first attempt had been Pop Clips, a show produced by former Monkey and music video pioneer Mike Nesmith, which predated MTV by a year. Nesmith wasn't the easiest personality to work with, and the show ended only after one season, but it's become a part of the mythology surrounding MTV, Nesmith claiming Pop Clips was MTV's direct predecessor. Nickelodeon and MTV were intertwined for many of their early years. Pop Clips had some influence on MTV, MTV's early success helped Nickelodeon survive as a lost leader for years, and in 1984, Warner Amex broke off MTV and Nickelodeon from their larger cable company and turned them into the MTV networks. Also, the movie channel was there, but that was already mostly owned by Viacom at that point. Really, MTV networks were just MTV and Nickelodeon, walking hand in hand. Management shakeups had resulted in one of MTV's founders, Robert Pittman, in charge of MTV networks. While Jerry Layborn had been promoted to Nickelodeon's new boss, the MTV guy was now her boss. And one thing Jerry Layborn was keen on was taking advantage of MTV's resources. Not just the music videos, but the entire visual language that made the channel so popular. One of the things that had made MTV so appealing was its fun, animated visual design for its logos and bumpers. And for that, we can thank Fred Siebert and Alan Goodman. 
Fred Sieber had come out of the music industry, working in college radio, independent record production, and distribution, then found himself working for television as the director of on-air promotions for the Movie Channel, formerly Star Channel. Also working on the Movie Channel was Robert Pittman and John Lack, another one of MTV's founders, and when MTV kicked off in 1981, Siebert was along for the ride to help develop the channel's visual brand. Well, you know, Bob Pittman, who was uh, the boss, and I both came out of radio. And radio at the time was a much more highly competitive thing than television. So in order to compete, radio stations had to develop personalities. We mm -hmm. didn't call them brands in those days. They were personalities. personalities. So Bob and I came out of radio, and because we were doing music on television, we instinctively understood, not consciously necessarily, yeah. understood that our music station on television had to have a personality too. Like yeah. that was natural to us. It was Siebert who brought in Alan Goodman. Siebert and Goodman had worked together in their college radio days, and Goodman had spent the previous five years doing copy for CBC Records. Now, Siebert will be the first to downplay their contribution, saying that MTV would have been successful with any visual identity. But the big M and I Want My MTV became iconic in a way that no other television advertising had. Still, Siebert and Goodman weren't very satisfied with their positions in the company. As, as proud as we were of our work, we kind of knew that we were riding on the coattails of this uh, rocket ship, and we really hated being corporate employees. And one day I was in a meeting and one of the big guys, like you know, one of the like, executive vice presidents of the company or something, started yelling at one of my colleagues and really humiliating the guy like horribly. And I left the room and I walked into Alan's office and I said, look, I, I'm out of here. I can never sit in a meeting like that again. I can never watch something like that happening. So Siebert and Goodman left MTV and formed their own advertising agency, Fred Allen Incorporated. And their first client as independent producers was MTV. For a third of the money they were making before, Siebert and Goodman were back to doing the exact same job they just quit. But they were reliable and talented producers and could now work on multiple companies at the same time. And Bob Pittman, as head of MTV Networks, was looking to give Nickelodeon a new coat of paint. On the programming end, Jerry Laybourne was putting in the work. She had gotten the department separated under Cy Schneider's leadership on the same page. She had formulated a game plan for the channel. She was doing extensive research with focus groups to determine what children wanted good, important work for Nickelodeon's future survival, but it still had that stuffy, green vegetable reputation to shake, and that would involve getting rid of the silver ball logo of old. We said, okay, so the problem isn't the shows. The problem is what you're telling people about the shows. And what was the common format of the television world at that point was when the shows aren't running and the commercials aren't running, there's promos that are saying, watch this show, watch it at this time, watch it now, it's great, it's fantastic, watch it a new episode. Now hear this, now hear this. Have you got the word? Mr. Wizard's World is moving to a brand new time. Look for him in all his tricks, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific, and again at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. Why don't we stop talking about the times the shows are on? You know, kids can't tell time, right? They, they actually know when every show is on based on when they get home from school. They go, yeah. well, the first thing that's on is this, and the second thing is that. I mean, they know. Mm -hmm. And we said, look, you know, there, from our point of view, there's no fun around here. She said, oh, yes, you know, we're always telling kids that Nickelodeon is fun, but, you know, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> so we set up what was our first rule. We said, okay, why don't we just ban the word fun? Why don't we actually start being fun? And why don't we just start having a good time at the jobs we do? And that'll translate into the work. Why don't we create an environment, a clubhouse environment, where it's no adults allowed. <laughs> and it's a place where a kid can feel safe being a kid and doing the kinds of things that kids like doing. Nickelodeon asks, what's bugging kids these days? My parents bug me. My parents make me clean up my room. Mom, Dad, get off my back. I hate the rules at school. I hate homework and I hate teachers. Let us do what we want. Yeah. Mom and Dad, let me keep my room a mess. Let kids do whatever they want. Let them be like the goat. Mom and Dad, get off my back. My mom and dad make me do stuff that I don't want to do. Kids don't need that stuff. We need more Nick. Nick is kids. 
Now, while Siebert and Goodman worked on Nickelodeon's new attitude and ethos, the actual orange logo was designed by Tom Corey and Scott Nash. A default splat shape inspired by the green slime of You Can't Do That on Television, a bright, unnatural orange, and a malleability that could be applied to a lot of different shapes and situations. Tom and Scott argued that orange clashed with everything, and that would make the logo stand out, as long as we didn't let designers try and make it work correctly. The splat could morph into any image we liked. I came along for the ride that Tom, Scott, and Alan were proposing, and we trucked over to Bob Pittman's and Jerry Laybourne's office to make the pitch. Bob and Jerry didn't buy it. No one else there did either. It doesn't match anything. It's flat. You guys do all the MTV logos with a lot of color. Shouldn't we have colors? It's not as cool as the MTV logo. What happened to you guys? Ultimately, we prevailed. So that was the visual design. Next comes the audio design. Their previous connections in the music industry brought them to the company of Ambient Sound, which recorded classic doo-wop groups. And through them, Siever and Goodman were introduced to Eugene Pitt and his group, The Jive Five. And we went into Nickelodeon and said, look, we think that the sound of Nickelodeon ought to be um, uh, acapella doo-wop. And they looked at us and they said, well, what about Rafi? Maybe we could use Rafi. He's really popular. So I suggested that really they just need to pay me enough to buy a gun so I could shoot myself before I, I would work with Rafi. And uh, I said, look, here's why you really want to do these doo-wop singers. You guys are all really nice, modern, progressive, liberal people. And you know, what we really need to do for the youth of America is introduce them to black music. You know, black music is the sound of America. It's the greatest music in the history of America. Everything has come from, you know, black R&B and jazz singers. That's why you need to do this. And they looked at me and said, you know, you're right. That's a great idea. And we made the sound of Nickelodeon uh, acapella duo. So let me tell you, it's a great honor to introduce these guys to Jive Five. <laughs> we talked to kids all over the nation. Kids they told us who deserved nominations. Nickelodeon. Kids cast their ballots at their favorite store. Yeah. Or send in letters of whom they're voting for. Kids show. Nick has the only show where kids could see. Are in every category. Can you believe it? Kiss choice, kiss choice, kiss choice. So they got their no adults allowed clubhouse attitude, they had a flexible visual design, and the smooth tones of the Jive 5. While we see the full effects of this come Nickelodeon 1985, this was the final step that would launch the channel from the bottom of the ratings to being the most watched channel in cable television. Nickelodeon's new on-air look takes an approach that encourages unending variety both in sound and on the screen. To understand it, one only has to look at a child at play to see the kind of creative thinking that we are trying to keep up with. Nickelodeon's past success in programming is based on staying in tune with kids' changing interests and habits. Our new channel concept draws from that bank of knowledge. The transition wasn't automatic. For a time, both the new orange splat commercials and the old silver ball commercials were both airing. The silver ball was still being used in sign-offs when the channel switched from Nickelodeon to the new rebranded Arts and Entertainment Network, for example. And one area where this transition can be seen is in the visual design of Nickelodeon's new music video show, Nick Rock's Video To Go. Nick says you got it coming. Beginning in June, Nick Rock's Video To Go. 30 supercharged minutes of hot video and super surprises from the channel that's gonna rock you. If you can handle rock and roll, you can handle Nick Rock's Video To Go. Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 Central, and Sunday at 12.30 Eastern, 11.30 Central. And best of all, you can tell your friends that you saw it on Nick. The circular record design that mirrors the silver ball and the multicolored balloon text that matches the old logo, it's all very pre-Fred Allen Incorporated visual design. But of course, it's a music video show drawing from MTV's libraries, something more modern and pulling away from Cy Schneider's influence. The main idea behind Nick Rocks wasn't just to be a half-hour music video show, but to have a level of audience participation children were encouraged to write into Nickelodeon and request videos, and these songs with the most requests were played. 
Uh, we have a letter here from Christina Peterson, who just moved from California to Colorado. Too many earthquakes, Christina? No. <laughs> Kidding. Well, let's see. She's pictured here with her friends, Morgan, Alexis, and Sharla. She wanted to see my video, so we have my new one, Shake Your Love. Here's Christina and her friends. And it worked amazingly. By 1987, Nickelodeon was receiving five to 6,000 letters a week. Some of these letters were printed in the newspaper. Dear Nick Rocks, my name is Diana. I am nine years old and in fourth grade. I am five feet tall and like to read. Every time I can, I watch your show. My favorite songs are Carrie from Europe. I also like Walk Like an Egyptian from the Bengals. Finally, I'd like to hear Look What the Cat Dragged In from Poison. Hi, Nick Rocks, my name is Howard. Play Is This Love from Whitesnake? This is the first time I asked. I think your show is the coolest. I am eight year old. Dear Nick Rocks, I am writing to say that I think you are great. I watch Nick Rocks every day. I wondered if you could play the video by George Michael, I Want Your Sex. You are the best. Love, Denise. Okay, they're probably not going to air that last one, Denise. Sorry. Nickelodeon is still a kids channel after all, and a music video where a naked George Michael is blindfolding a woman in bed just isn't going to fly. I know it probably awoke something in you, Denise, but parents will complain. Yes, Nickelodeon made sure that all the videos were appropriate for kids, and that's not a big task. Despite Ted Turner's fear-mongering, MTV didn't air a lot of risque material. George Michael videos were more the exception than the rule. Of course, there's no way to prove that Nick Rocks actually abided by the majority vote in these letters. I'm not saying they didn't, but you know, marketing forces are greater than eight-year-olds writing letters after all. But these letters were still important and encouraged because they were easy data collection. With 6,000 letters a week, you can get pretty good demographic numbers on what percentage of Nickelodeon viewers live where, their ages, and the gender ratio. If there's one person who loves collecting data on children's interests, it's Jerry Layborn, and Nick Rocks was a fun, cheap, harmless way to do so. Episodes tended to be hosted by more family-friendly acts, like They Might Be Giants, Weird Al Yankovic, The Monkees minus Mike Nesmith, and Mike Nesmith minus The Monkees. Uh, because uh, I love the guys, and they love me, I guess, and uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a gas. Nick, Nick Rocks, Rocks video to go. go! I'll take three orders, please. One, two, three. Maybe I'll take one order. <laughs> Maybe I won't take an order at all. Maybe I'll take a bus. Excuse me. Oh, it's like having your divorced parents show up for your birthday party, but they stay in separate rooms as often as possible. Another thing Nick Rocks helped facilitate were contests and sweepstakes. The very first giveaway Nickelodeon ever had was in October of 1984, a live call-in music trivia contest where five kids won prizes like an Eastman Kodak Instamatic camera and autographed photos by Ralph Macchio and Hall and & Oates. This would be the first of many giveaways Nickelodeon would give over the decades. As the channel became more successful, the prizes became more exuberant. Disneyland vacation packages, concert tickets, truckloads of toys, and all of these contests delivered through Nick Rocks for the five years it was on air. Welcome back to the Nick Rocks Top Picks of 86. It's our 350th show with your number one video of the year coming up in just seconds. Ooh. In 1986, you want cases of M&Ms and Skittles, Casio keyboards, Ohio Arts animators, tons of Kool-Aid, record albums, and Nick Rocks jackets. Jacenia Avellas was a jet for a day, and Janet Bellano was a star for a day. You've seen kids guest hosts, stars guest hosts, rock stars, movie stars, all with the video you request from over 250,000 letters. Yeah. Thanks for making Nick Rocks your number one show in 1986. Really, there isn't much to say about this show itself. It was a music video show and not one with a gimmick or the storied history behind it like pop clips. What's important was what was going on around it, its audience engagement and its connections to MTV. Fred Siebert and Alan Goodman promoted the idea of having Nickelodeon be a kids-only clubhouse, and that would include being hip to what kids of the 1980s liked, and asking the children directly, let them tell you what they liked. Child empowerment, or at least the illusion of such. Nick Rocks ended in the summer of 1989 after a non-stop five-year run. 
It probably could have kept going. It was cheap to produce, and music videos still had about a decade's worth of relevancy to them. But Nickelodeon was slowly but surely revving up to produce a ton of original content for the 1990s, and Nick Rocks was probably cancelled to make room for that. But while Nick Rocks was no more, the name Nick Rocks still had some value, and in 1991, it would see something of a revival. your socks. It's time for a song with Nick Jr. Rocks. Now it's time to catch a tune about fun in the sun on your own sand dune. Or out on a wave, feeling the breeze as you glide across the ocean with the greatest of ease. Nick Jr. Nick Jr. Rocks! The relationship between Nick Rocks and Nick Jr. Rocks is really only that of branding. Nick Jr. Rocks didn't have kids writing in requests, it didn't facilitate contests, and it didn't have celebrity hosts. It wasn't even a half-hour show, it was a five-minute segment that aired between shows on the Nick Jr. programming block. Honestly, evoking the Nick Rocks brand is the only thing that makes it stand out from any other time Nickelodeon aired shorts between shows. But unlike the original Nick Rocks, which was fun, but also very easy and plug-and-play to produce that there wasn't a lot to talk about, Nick Jr. Rocks has a bit more of an interesting history, and that comes down to one woman. Shelley Duvall. Duvall had made a name for herself as part of Robert Altman's staple of actors, appearing in films like Brewster McCloud, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, Nashville, and Three Women, and then became really well known when she played Wendy Torrance in Stanley Kubrick's 1980 adaptation of The Shining, an experience she hated. After that, Duvall began to pivot towards children's media, playing Olive Oil in the live-action Popeye film, a small role in Time Bandits, and she appeared in one of Tim Burton's first short films, Frankenweenie. Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. Welcome to Fairy Tale Theater. In 1982, Shelley Duvall created Fairy Tale Theater, a 27 episode children's anthology series for Showtime, which she served as host and executive producer. A critical success for the channel, she would follow it up in 1985 with the nine episode series Tall Tales and Legends and the four episode Nightmare Classics in 1989. So she had plenty of children's media production experience when Duvall and Nickelodeon crossed paths in 1991. The original plan for Nick Jr. Rocks was a proper half hour television program, but the music videos had to be produced originally. They weren't pre existing music videos from elsewhere. So while they were building up a library, it was decided to air single music videos during the commercial breaks until there was enough material to edit into a longer format. After three years, they never got there, partially due to a lack of support from advertisers. Still, it was a project that Duvall had a lot of faith in. There are virtually no children's radio stations, and kids love music. They dance, they memorize the words, Duvall said. She recalled a recent occasion when she visited friends who have a toddler. The child was transfixed by the video for Billy Idol's song, Rebel Yell. There was this little kid in diapers, singing and raising his fat little fist to the sky. It's marvelous, but it's scary in a way, she said. Nick Jr. was already pretty committed to preschool performers. The Nick Jr. Rocks videos aired alongside Sharon Lois and Bram's Elephant Show and Fred Penner's Place. So producing works for Doug and Gary the Happy Pirates wasn't a stretch. 1991 was actually a big year for preschool performers. That was the year the Wiggles started. And say what you want about the Wiggles, they are the Beatles of this kind of music. And then there was Raffi, but I don't think Nickelodeon aired any Raffi. Really, they just need to pay me enough to buy a gun so I could shoot myself before <laughs> I, I would work with Raffi. Lacking the momentum to become a full series, Duvall turned Nick Jr. Rocks to a side project while she produced a new show in 1992, Shelley Duvall's Bedtime Stories. Nick Jr. Rocks slowly phased out and was gone completely by 1994. Shelley Duvall would have one more interaction with Nickelodeon, guest starring in an episode of Ah Real Monsters in 1997. No. 
Nick Rocks and Nick Jr. Rocks are surprisingly different programs with different goals and methods, but they both speak to the universality of music. Music is for everybody, and while trends and genres can change with time, it's an art form that has something for everyone, and that includes children of all ages. Unlike Nickelodeon's attempts at sports programming, they've never failed when it comes to musical television. Even if the shows themselves are short-lived, they still appeal to the channel's young audience. It's a truth that MTV knew and helped Nickelodeon realize. When in doubt, put on a little tune. Next time, Nickelodeon takes us back to the past, when television was in black and white and a dog could get top billing. Today's research shoutout goes to the Fred Allen Archive, which contains a lot of materials from Fred Siebert and Alan Goodman's time on MTV and Nickelodeon, the definitive story of the orange splat. Thank you all for watching. If you've been enjoying Nick Knacks, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to production values, research materials, and fixing the coolant leak in my car. You can also support Knickknacks and the Pop Arena by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, using the bell icon for notifications, leaving a one-time donation through coffee, following me on Twitter, and sharing Knickknacks with all of your friends. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you next time.